Parker, are we good? Amazing. Hi, Matt. That's fine. See, this is why, hello. There we go. I think we're fixed now. Y'all can hear me, right? Let me make sure I'm not muted on anything else. All the other clips. There we go. Perfect. Uh, will you say your name for me so I don't screw it up when I read it for the intro when we record the podcast? Sure thing. My name is Lane Nooney. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, so chat, if this is the first time for the new kind of variation of cyber, we're, we're going to record the podcast. We're going to do it a little bit later in. I've got a nice little recording graphic I'm going to put on when we're on air and the recording's in progress that everyone can see. But for, for now, we're just going to, we're just going to chill out for a minute. We're just going to hang out. We're just going to talk about, uh, 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 this, this wonderful book a little bit before we, before we jump right into it. I, uh, it's really good. And I'll t we'll talk about it more when the uh, recording officially starts. One question I did have for you. Uh, did you watch the TV show Halt and Catch Fire by chance? Yes. You yes. did? Okay. Yeah. Uh, good, because you're one of the only people that did. <laughs> I love it. Uh, but it was, a, it was one of the... I kept thinking about it as I was reading this book. Um, and kind of having this fascinating window into the early age of computing... Uh, from some of its big, like, fictional failures, these people that mm -hmm. were, like, almost there. Yeah. Did you like that show at all? I mean, I think I struggled with that show, especially its early seasons, because it was so much playing off the dynamic of the sort of technical genius and the kind of charismatic marketer yep. that felt very much like a Jobs Wozniak rehash. Uh, I always, you know, I, 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 I always thought the most interesting character was Donna, and she doesn't really get, I feel like, her proper screen time until much later in the series. Uh, I haven't done a rewatch. I also, there's something about a lot of 80s era television where it feels like they really treat that decade like a, a set or a prop rather than a context. Yeah. Uh, and I, I find it difficult that like the the kind of political con political conditions of the era sort of disappear. And what you're left with are all these like Star Wars toys and uh, you know- They're playing Super Mario spells. Brothers. Yeah, then, that yeah. It, it becomes a kind of nostalgic um, uh, mode of thinking about the 80s rather than the 80s having any other kind of political context. And I, I find that a little hard, you know, to to stomach sometimes. So, so I Stranger have Things also right out then, because that's all that is, basically. <laughs> well, at least it's not trying to be a, a historical television show, right? I can that's give a, a bit more of a pass to, um, to something that is already playing in the speculative a bit. But yeah, I, you know... It's in in general, those are not my my genres, you know. Is but. there is there like a television show that does capture the mood and feel of the eighties then? Have you seen anything of, that does it? Of the eighties? That's a good question. I always for me the pinnacle of this um in television is Mad Men. I think the way Mad Men does the sixties, mm -hmm. or they do a version of the sixties really, really well. Um and that it feels very lived in and like everyone is living in that time. Uh, but I'm the eighties. That's a good question. It's a good question. Somebody I'd have the, to think on it a bit. Nothing jumps to mind. Somebody in the chat says, and this is a good answer. Chernobyl. <laughs> yeah. Whatever the eighties were like in Russia at that time. Right. right. Um, uh, that show, that show is lovely. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I would use the word lovely, but it's one, it's, uh, it's a, it's lush. It's, it's it's yeah, dire and uh, stressful. So. That's... So are you doing a are you doing a book tour for this? Uh, so I haven't really uh, pulled around a book tour. I will be having a book launch in San Francisco next week, uh, May eleventh at six p.m. It'll be hosted at the Internet Archive. Uh, nice. Let me pull down the Eventbrite link so anyone who is. Um, 
you know, if you're in the Bay Area, it's definitely free and open to the public. There'll be some snacks, some wine. I'll be doing a kind of giving a little talk about the back history of the book, doing a little reading. And I'll be in conversation with uh, a friend of mine, Finn Brunton, who's written books about like the history of spam, the history of cryptocurrency, uh, really lovely guy out at UC Davis. So let me just get. While you're doing that, one of my cats is very upset because I closed uh, a window. I'm gonna I'm gonna open the blinds for her so she can be in the sun. Hold on one moment. No problem. And that's me in the chat. I'm Sierra offline, which is also my Twitter handle. If you want to follow me over there, uh, I sometimes co-run a Sierra online uh, game Twitch stream. Uh, I used to do that far more regularly, but we now we now pop back up now and again. Me and my friend Ramsey Nazar. It's such a good, um, such a good screen name, Sierra Offline. What was your favorite Sierra era game? Oh, that's probably. Um, I mean, in terms of games that were, you know, actually playable. Oh God, Benny, is that you from class? My student <laughs> is maybe in here. It's fine. <laughs> um, chief undergrad, Benny. Um, uh, I really loved the, I think Quest for Glory 1 is a pretty unbeatable game in terms of structure, plot, world building, um, you know, puzzle design is really coherent. The stuff they managed to kind of jerk out of that game engine to build an RPG game uh, using the Sierra game engine is pretty incredible. Uh, I also really like Christy Marx's stuff. I just think it has a lot of like depth and flavor. So Conquest of Camelot, Conquest of the Longbow. Uh, I think those are really fun games. I don't remember these these quests. I think I remember the box. This box Quest looks for, vaguely yeah. familiar. Yeah, so Lori and Corey Cole were the designers, and they did five of them, technically. I think Quest for Glory 1 and 2 are maybe the best. Um, and I think the the old 16-color one. Quest for Glory 1 is a, is a, it's a really, just a really good game. And you could tell the people, the designers at Sierra, who had some background in either storytelling or game development. Lauren Craig Cole did a lot of like tabletop uh, Dungeons and Dragons RPG stuff. And it totally translates. Whereas so many Sierra games are like, this isn't even a story. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like what's even happening? There's no, you know, uh, plot is really, that's a big question mark. I think for almost every King's Quest game. Yeah. You know, and it's not really a plot here. You know? It's a lot of walking around and like the, the game function of it is I've got a bag full of stuff and I rub things yeah. together until the door unlocks. Yeah. Right? I've got a lantern. I need to use it somewhere to get a key that like gets me a princess. You know, it's, it's like a Rube Goldberg machine. And it's never of. intuitive ever. Mm -hmm. We rem it's funny. We remember like the really good ones, but there were so many of the, like we remember the monkey Island games and I think people remember the King's Quests. I think there was like a Space Quest 1, too, that was pretty terrible, if I recall correctly. <laughs> uh, but there were there were so many of these. There were so many of these games. Yeah, it was a huge uh, kind of business. for. I mean, Sierra at one point by the mid-90s was the largest producer of consumer software in the world. Like, I remember, like in 1995. Uh, That's which, wild. It's wild. Yeah, they had bought up so many other companies uh, and they were producing so many other types of software that weren't just games. And so I, I think in a funny way, this does sort of relate to the book where one of my one of my real points of interest as both a video game historian and a computer historian is that we tend to overlook all the non-game stuff that game companies do. And we really have to think about them as being in a software industry and not just a game industry if we want to understand like why computers were important. I don't want to I don't want to burn pod here before I hit the record oh, button. Sure. But Sorry. there was no I'm but like the ahead. there was a moment as I'm reading it where I was like, "Oh yeah, print shop." <laughs> I could suddenly hear the noise of the dot matrix printer. Uh and I remember I have like this very vivid memory of my father was uh, my father was a software engineer in the Silicon Prairie in the '90s. Uh, we were in the suburbs outside of Dallas. He worked for Texas Instruments, um, and he would work over the weekends. And I remember he would have to print stuff, 
And I remember waking up on Sunday mornings to the sound of the dot matrix, dot matrix printer and him yelling at it because it was a dot matrix printer and they all were horrible and you couldn't get any, like it was a nightmare. And so that was like how I would wake up every Sunday was my, my engineer father fighting a piece of technology. <laughs> um, I feel like that's a weird origin story for me now as I'm, as I, as I'm speaking no, it out I, loud. I think, I think the sound of, like printer sound is an is an underrated part of uh, people's computer history memories, and and I think the the print shop chapter was really compelling to the editor. They were like a chat like no one's talked about this software in ages, right? Um, so you yeah, will put I'll, a we'll put a pin in that yeah <laughs> because I've I've got questions about, about it minutes. for sure. Yeah. I was looking at the pictures in the book. I was like, oh my god, I remember. I remember like doing anyway, we'll get there. <laughs> we'll talk about the book, but talk about the book. Yeah, I have uh sadly because I'm not as prepared as I want to be, so it's still like in the drop box, but there it is. The Apple II age, how the computer <laughs> became personal. Well, I'm also I'll link to the page on my website uh where you know if folks wanna it's got the blurbs, it's got a link to buying it from the publisher. Um, you can also, of course, get it on Amazon. I think the prices are about comparable or your favorite local bookstore, you know? Um, so let me, uh, here's another bit of table setting that everyone gets to watch, uh, watch me do live. Let me read my intro for the podcast and for you real quick. I'm going to do a rough read on it before we hit the record. And I think we're probably ready to launch in because now I just want to talk about the book. So if cool. we're going to do that, I should, I should hit the record button. All right, uh, blah, 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 blah. If you're watching or listening to the show, you're probably doing it on a device that owes its very existence to the Apple II. But these days, we remember the iPhone, 90s era Windows, and even the Macintosh as these big benchmark moments in widespread adoption of tech. But all those devices wouldn't be here if it weren't for the little Apple II board that could and the people who turned a hobbyist curiosity into a fundamental part of every household in the world. That story is the subject of the new book, The Apple II Age, How the Computer Became Personal. With us here today to talk about it is Lay Nooney. Nooney is an assistant professor of media and information studies at New York University and the founding editor of Romchip, a journal of games histories. Does that all sound good? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to turn on my new recording graphic. I'm going to hit the record button. I'm going to play the intro music. I'm going to put on my, my podcaster voice. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to do the real, the real intro. I'll be quiet. Ken, it's got the code. It's going to launch. It's a Unix system. I know this. It can set all the files of the whole park. It tells her everything. Oh. Sir, he's uploading the virus. Eagle one, the package is being delivered. Hello out there on the internet. I am Matthew Galt, and this is Cyber. If you're watching or listening to the show, you've, you are probably doing it on a device that owes its very existence to the Apple II. But these days, we remember the iPhone, 90s era Windows, and even the Macintosh as these big benchmark moments in widespread adoption of tech. But all those devices wouldn't be here if it weren't for the little Apple II board that could and the people who turned a hobbyist curiosity into a fundamental part of every household in the world. That story is the subject of the new book, The Apple II. That story is the subject of the new book, The Apple II Age, How the Computer Became Personal. And with us here today to talk about it is Lane Nooney. Nooney is the Nooney is an assistant professor of media and information studies at New York University and the founding editor of Romchip, a journal of games histories. Thank you so much for coming onto the show. Thank you, Matt. It's my pleasure. So I love uh, before I hit the record button, I can just blow through that intro perfectly. Uh, <laughs> then I have to do it while I'm recording and I stumble twice. That always happens. Good times. Good times, me. Post-production exists for a reason, you know? That's like, I'm just gonna let it go. I'm just gonna let people see see how the sausage gets made. Yeah. That's oh. how that's how we roll on my podcast too. It's just like, nobody think, has time to fix this. It, well, it's, it's nobody has time. And there's something about, I, I've been noticing, especially lately that the podcasts and the YouTube channels I like are the ones that are less heavy with the post-production and feel more intimate, you know? 
Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Part of what you're showing up for is the feeling of being present with this person, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, all right, so I wanted to find terms here because uh, I thought personal computer was specifically a Windows machine. Oh, uh, yeah. And yeah. we're talking about Apple products. What's going on here? Can you define what personal computer means? Yeah, sure. So one of the things I have to contend with in writing this book is that we, you know, first off, I think we we use the term today personal computer to me, I, I think actually in a very generic way to refer to any kind of like personal computational, uh, you know, a laptop, a desktop computer. I think people use personal computer to refer to apples and window machines with, you know, uh, kind of regardless. But when we go back to the history of when these machines first started getting invented, they actually had a much more specific definition. Personal computer in the late 70s, very early 80s, actually referred to kind of microcomputers that were intended for the office. And there were, and then the opposite market category for that was home computers, which were intended for the home. I think now we would call all of these things personal computers. And I go to a special effort in my book to say that the word we're actually going to use is microcomputer because that is a word that's it's not uh, it avoids being anachronistic. It's it's the language that was used at the time in the late seventies, early eighties to talk about these machines. There were so many different terms that were actually used to talk about these different kinds of you know a, a general purpose computing system of size and scale appropriate for individual use. I think is the 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 general definition I make. Um, but, you know, whether you're talking about a TRS-80, an IBM PC, an Apple II, an Atari 800, these were all uh, microcomputers, or, you know, in, in in historical terms. An Atari 800. I haven't thought about that in a very long time. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. No problem. I'm full of that, you know. <laughs> um, you you kind of lit on something that I think is really interesting. So Apple II launches, is it... For some reason, my, I know I just read this book, and for some reason, it's like 1974 and 1977 are the dates that are sticking in my brain. I don't know. It's if my... 1977, and I will Thank probably you. also need to reference my own book at some point because, you know, it's a lot of information. Can but... you can you talk a little bit more about what the landscape is like in the realm of computing in 1977? Like, sure. what is being sold? Like, people think of computers as, as a room full of machines, right? Uh, yeah. So, well, at, you know, at this point, most people had never really seen a person, what we would today call a personal computer or a microcomputer. Uh, to talk about 1977, I'm going to go back two years to talk about 1975 and what gets released in 1975 is what's considered the first sort of kind of consumer facing, uh, you know, microcomputer, the Altair 8800. It's basically a hobbyist machine. It, it debuts on the cover of Popular Electronics in January 1975. It's just a blue metal case full of boards and wires. You have to program the thing yourself using switches. And that's kind of, you know, computers for that, because they were so complicated and difficult to use, there was a hobbyist interest in them. Uh, people who were kind of electrical engineers and kind of did that as a hobby wanted to buy these machines, but there wasn't any kind of, that was not a thing that like everyday people were going to pick up and use. But this market begins to develop, right? Look, you know, and, and part of that's in Silicon Valley, but it's also happening a bit nationwide. And there's a few companies that begin to get the idea in 1976, 1977, Maybe there's a general consumer market here. There we go. There's the Altair 8800. Um, this is infamously the machine that Bill Gates and Paul Allen wrote BASIC for, right, which allowed them to launch the company Microsoft. Um, uh, but so in 1977, uh, historians sometimes refer to this as the second wave of microcomputing. Uh, or the the because what gets released in 1977 are three very important microcomputers. The TRS-80, the Trash-80 from the radio, from Radio Shack, the Commodore PET, uh, and the Apple II, and these are referred to as kind of the 1977 Trinity. They were these three computers that were really different from the Altair, right? Because suddenly they were computers that came to you with a monitor and they had a keyboard, and there was really this idea of a human who was going to sit down and use this thing, right? So there had been a lot of effort put into redesigning these 
um, in, a, in, a, in a technical way, these machines really take on the characteristic of, of like a teletype terminal. Um, so, you know, or kind of like dumb terminals of the 1970s that were used in time sharing. But yeah, you had input and output. All of it was surrounded in a case. Uh, there was usually an onboard programming language like BASIC uh, that came with these machines. And the idea was to see if we could figure out how to sell these machines, maybe not to the masses, uh, but, you know, could there be a market for people who wanted to own their own microcomputers uh, and use them in a way that was a little more accessible than something like the Altair? And that's the 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 kind of context in which we get the Apple II. Um, Apple had released its it's hard to say Apple, it was basically Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs uh, right. had kind of made a little, you know, had made, had produced a uh, computer board called the Apple One in 1976. Uh, they didn't sell a lot of them. It was kind of a proof of concept more than anything else, but they did get enough investment that formed kind of seed money for that, for Wozniak to be able to work on the Apple II. Sorry, that's a very long answer. But, you know, 1977, no one cares about Unless you're a computer hobbyist, you don't care about these machines, right? Well, yeah. The, and, I mean, the, literally you have, I just pulled up for people that are listening to the podcast, Isaac Asimov is selling, that's the person they use to sell <laughs> the Trash 80, right? Which is like such a specific niche. I mean, he's like huge author, right? But it's the kind of thing, like if you're using Isaac Asimov as the person, as your spokesperson, it's a very specific audience that you're going for, Right. Yeah, there wasn't yet the idea that there was a, um, I think a lot of these, I think these companies kind of hoped that they could turn this into a general consumer item. Later, Commodore in the mid 80s adopts Alan Alda as uh, one of its spokespeople, right? Going, I don't think going I've for seen a, that actually, that's why. Going for a bit more mainstream coverage. But yeah, computing at this time, it was incredibly difficult. It was extremely niche. Unless you had exposure in your workplace usually, uh, you know, as an electrical engineer working in the computing industries in some way, these technologies stayed pretty uh, isolated to those kind of to that kind of, you know, cultural hobbyist activity uh, in, in, you know, much of the late 70s. I have to bring this up for the people that are looking. Check that out. There, there it yeah. is. <laughs> Alan Alda. Wow. Yeah, there's some. Yeah, there's. Some, I love that one of him that's like in the middle where he's. You know, I mean, oh, I, the, I, that is great. Yeah. I believe that Bill Cosby was used as a spokesman, I think, for the TR, for the, I think maybe the Coca for one of the Radio Shack machines, I believe, um, which is, yeah, a more horrifying <laughs> point um, of reference. Uh, speaking of uh, large and problematic personalities that dominate a conversation, uh, we can't not talk about Steve Jobs. Of right, course. like integral to this story. Um, I'm going to play a little clip here that you open the you kind of open the book with, which is the the introduction of the iPhone in 2007, um, which is uh, I'm sorry you are not going to be able to hear the audio, but the audience can. Uh, but I'm going to pull it up. This is a day I've been looking forward to for two and a half years. Every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. <coughs> and Apple has been, well, first of all, one's very fortunate if you get to work on just one of these in your career. Apple's been very fortunate. It's been able to introduce a few of these into the world. In 1984, we introduced the Macintosh. It didn't just change Apple. It changed the whole computer industry. Uh, all right, I'm going to pause there. So this is how you open the book. This, this presentation, Jobs says, here's the Macintosh. It changed the world of computing, 1984. Um, I mean, I remember that advertisement. But if I recall correctly, isn't this, was this a success? And isn't the Apple II more important for the story of both Apple and personal computing? Uh, why, in the iPhone presentation, which is going to change the world, are we talking about this thing and not the Apple II? 
Uh, that's a great question. So there's there's a couple of different reasons. I think one of them is Jobs' is vanity, right? I think the 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 Macintosh, uh, I think, got reconstructed as a success uh, for, retrospectively, right? Uh, it came to be acknowledged or understood as this innovative moment in computer history, even though at the time it was really not a particularly successful machine, right? It, it was not the Apple II, and, and part of the reason I want to look at this moment where Jobs is basically saying Apple starts with the history of the, the Macintosh and the graphical user interface. And I'm really interested in this moment where he is he's doing history in front of an audience, but there's such an explicit agenda for him in that. And so he wants to make the history of Apple about this history of like user interface interaction, right? Because the rest of his chronology is going to go Macintosh, iPod, and then we're going to get to the glories of the iPhone, right? So he wants to construct this very particular narrative. But in doing so, he overlooks the thing that actually launched Apple as a company, which was the Apple II. That was why, you know, Apple went public before the Macintosh ever came out. It was a publicly traded company because of the success of the Apple II. And I would say that if you want to understand what consumer computing culture looked like, in the 1980s, you get a much better portrait looking at that through something like the Apple II than you do something like the Macintosh. And it's funny too, because it is kind of, the Apple II allowed this kind of, I would say Jobs-like vision of what home, it, it allowed him to get to where he thought computers could go, right? And if it weren't for the way that that thing was set up and the way it was marketed and everyone that kind of came in and built on top of the product that that they had made, um, we wouldn't have gotten there. You were you were you were doing this thing, which means that you kind of sort of agree with me, but you but it's more complicated. Can you uh, tell me why I'm wrong? Yeah, I think the success of the Apple II is really a Wozniak story in a lot of ways, right? Um, he was the engineer. He designed that hardware. Jobs went actually came into conflict with Wozniak about one of the qualities or affordances of the Apple II series that would wind up being one of its greatest successes, which is the number of expansion ports that the, the machine would have. Wozniak, Wozniak came to computer engineering as, uh, you know, as a hobbyist, as somebody who like lived, breathed, ate, drank engineering, right? That guy in high school was drawing electrical schematics, right? He just, he had, he, you know, he was an extremely gifted person who also was born into exactly the right place to be one of the most, to become one of the most innovative thinkers in electrical engineering around computing of his lifetime. And that device lock, stock and barrel is a Steve Wozniak production. What Jobs did was he came in and he had, there's a, there's a prehistory to this between Wozniak and Jobs, but Jobs was really good at knowing where other people were making things that he thought he could sell. And so, you know, he comes in with this kind of interest in financialization, interest in capitalizing on Wozniak's technical creativity. There's not a lot in the historical record that would suggest that Wozniak on his own would have had a lot of interest in selling uh, these devices. He certainly, I don't think, would have ever tried to become an entrepreneur of his own right. Uh, and so, you know, there was this intermeshment between, you know, Wozniak's device would have gone nowhere without Jobs, but also, you know, the as soon as Apple got investment, which happened before they released the Apple II, uh, they had, you know, their their main investor, Mike Markula, was bringing in really serious advertising companies to like do the polish on the trade shows and the advertisements. Uh, I, you know, Jobs had a big hand in the industrial design of the final product, but I think sometimes maybe we give him a little too much credit in the marketing department for the Apple II. And I the the device would not have been successful if it did not have the explicit kind of hardware affordances and capacities that Wozniak built into that machine. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? I'm gonna pull up a picture of it here. Like what was it about this machine that helped make computers personal? Uh, yeah, so it's helpful to think about it in the context of the other machines that were coming out at the time, right? I think that 
one of the things to get good computer histories, we have to get away from thinking about machines as individual objects, right? And see them in these big economic contexts. Uh, you know, its main competition at the time were products like the TRS-80 and the Commodore PET. Uh, of those three, in 1977, 1978, the Apple II actually sold the least for the first couple of years that it was out. Uh, the TRS-80 took off. Um, largely, these were because of price point issues. Um, the Apple II was the most expensive because it was the most hardware robust. Uh, it, it, it was a machine, you know, it had a higher degree of starting RAM. It was kind of more complex in terms of its technical engineering. Um, but what wound up happening was that in this very short period of time, the, the kind of base price of computing components dropped while while their kind of capacity went up, right? Basic Moore's Law stuff. And so devices like the original Commodore PET or the TRS-80 were not really designed to be expandable. And so they were more so designed to be almost obsolete by the time, you know, 1979, 1980 rolls around. But what's interesting is the Apple II was such a robust machine that you could basically just keep plugging RAM boards into it, or you could buy the Apple II Plus, the Apple II E uh, later on in the 80s. And so it had a it had a kind of inherent kind of expandability that meant that it could grow as the potential market grew. And so Apple didn't have to go back to the drawing board and like reimagine how to make another consumer computer. It was all, it was all like um, kind of built into the system itself because Wozniak had that hobbyist instinct that, you know, people who are hackers and hardware hobbyists are gonna wanna be able to get into the guts of their machine. That's also an important part of the industrial design of the Apple II. If you look back at the image of it, um, the, the lid of the Apple II just lifts right off, right? And this is such an underrated part of the design of the machine is you can actually put your hands inside of it, right? You can plug in your own cards. Uh, you can pull, plug in your own expansion boards, right? And the other two machines, the TRS-80 didn't open at all. There was no real uh, kind of hardware hacker expandability built into it. And the Commodore PET, if you've ever opened one, opened like the hood of a car. Uh, so like the whole computer was kind of over top of the board. And, and this kind of attention to the openness, to the ability of letting the users direct access if they want to, right? Plenty of people didn't. Plenty of people were just interested. I want to be able to turn a computer on. I want it to run the, the software that I have. But when they needed to upgrade the RAM, when they wanted to add floppy disks, they didn't have to like take it back to Radio Shack to get an ex a whole separate expansion kit or something like that. They could just buy those products and install them themselves. And and so, so the Apple II had this kind of funky quality where it could make hobbyists, hardcore hobbyists happy, but it was also usable enough for people who had no exposure to computing previously. And that was like the magic spot that made this piece of hardware have so much longevity. Well, and I would also say just one comment. It's funny that it's funny, the design of this thing, given where Apple has gone now. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, with their beautiful walled garden, uh, nothing to be able to pull apart and, you know, hard to even repair your, your, put a new battery in your uh, your iPhone yeah. anyway. Um, I mean, well, yeah, Apple Apple went that way immediately and that was a jobs decision. You can't take apart a Macintosh without special equipment. Uh, when I, I when that. I when I teach my history of personal computing class, I have students try and take these two machines apart. And one of the, you know, an Apple II li li lifts right off. An Apple IIc, you can unscrew it and get to the board. A Macintosh, good luck. Yep. You're not cracking that thing open. Um, and it really signals, I think, a very different future of what, quote unquote, personal computing was going to become, right, under the vision of Steve Jobs, right? Uh, but the other part of this, and I think the, the story that is the bulk of your book, is that hardware is only part of the story. It is what you do with that hardware that makes computers personal and makes them ubiquitous, right? It is yeah. all about the software. <laughs> yeah, I, that's that's absolutely correct. I think that there's a lot of computer history that is a kind of 
fetish of the machine. And, uh, or there's a lot of computer history that does a sort of access journalism thing where it's focused on, you know, what did Steve Jobs, you know, all the interviews I do, they want to start by talking about Steve Jobs. And it's like, knowing what Steve Jobs thought about any given thing really doesn't tell us a lot about why people thought computers were useful, actually, right? The man was not a mind reader of the entire universe. And so if we want to understand what an average consumer, how they made sense of a computer, why they thought one was worth buying, we actually have to look at the things they did with them. And that very particularly is a software story, right? We can't, and there's no way to get to that story except by going through software. I think that a lot of computer, the ideas we have about personal computing is that, you know, it showed up on the scene and then everyone immediately knew that they should have one and they wanted one. And it's like, that's not true. Um, computers were a hard sell to the American public. They actually had a pretty slow adoption rate. And if you want to, you really have to understand what were the rationales that people were working through to figure out why would I even want to buy this thing, right? It wasn't obvious to people um, what was valuable about a computer. It's so funny. As I was researching this episode, I found uh, an interview from, a, I think, a Japanese documentary where they interview Steve Jobs about how important VisiCalc is. Yes. It's just like, why? Like, it's, it just really speaks to that. Like, he has this overpowering presence in all yep. of this stuff. Uh, yes. But I do want to talk about VisiCalc specifically because it's the first software chapter. Um, this, I've got a great line pulled out from the book here. Um, the sensation VisiCalc bestowed of not just com com commanding a Cartesian view of... Bleh, bleh, this is why we do... This, this I am going to edit out because that was embarrassing. The sensation VisiCalc bestowed of not just commanding a Cartesian view of a world of numbers down below, but of being able to alter their output, emboldened fiscal manipulators to tweak scenarios to perfection and then execute them in the real world. What was VisiCalc and why was it so important? Uh, we, we would, I think, most easily say that VisiCalc was the first digital spreadsheet software. So it was released in 1979. It was co-developed by Dan Bricklin and Bob Frankston, who were both kind of MIT alum. Uh, you know, uh, Bricklin was, uh, you know, he was getting his MBA at Harvard. And they, so Bricklin was working in a context where he was constantly having to do, as a, as a business student, financial manipulation. And that, that kind of thing at the time was almost, was largely done by hand, or you had to use a time-sharing mini computer if you wanted to write your own program to run your own financial analyses. It was very cumbersome stuff. And the idea, you know, it was actually their publisher, um, Dan Feistra at Personal Software, who kind of pitched them on the idea of make this for a microcomputer, right? And the, really the only computer that had the specs that could run something as, as complex as VisiCalc. This is 1979. 1979, most software is still on a cassette, right? I mean, you're talking about these, these guys trying to program a digital spreadsheet in 36K. Like, that's, that's wild. And there was really the only consumer-facing computer micro that could do it was the Apple II. Uh, there was no chance that the TRS-80 or the Commodore PET could had the, the specs capable of, of running software like that. And so they basically create this software that looks like an Excel sheet or a Google sheet does today. It's, you know, rows of columns, you know, it's a grid of rows and columns. And what was so innovative about it was that you could put all these numbers in and then you could basically just assign a calculation to any set of numbers. So it was, it, it could, it was so flexible as an idea. Before this, you know, if you worked in finance, you had to, write a program for every individual type of financial analysis you wanted to do, right? Which was incredibly time consuming. Um, but this, this idea of giving people a framework in which to do mathematical operations that was kind of indifferent to the content, that had, you know, it was, it, that, that was a kind of, um, I don't want to quite use the word revolutionary, but it was a thing that displayed the magic of what computers could do. And then if you changed a value, you saw it repopulate live on screen. And that was a shocking thing to folks was, was that the, the, the analysis was instantaneous 
Because the other alternative was either you were doing this stuff by hand or you were sending requests. If you worked in like, a, let's say a stock brokerage, maybe you were sending requests to your data processing department in your company saying, please, please, please run my numbers. <laughs> and three days later, you'll get an answer on your quarterlies. And um, so when businessmen found out about this and there were some journalists who were explicitly trying to promote VisiCalc to business communities, um, there were there's this great anecdote of this guy Stan Veit, who ran one of probably the biggest computer shop in Manhattan. It was in in Midtown, um, I think, just called Computer Shop, and he remembered the moment that these like you know th uh, three suit you know uh, you know jacket and vest and tie guys from Wall Street started walking into his computer store saying, "I want a VisiCalc machine." They didn't, they didn't know what computer it ran in. It didn't matter because they didn't care about the computer. What they wanted was that piece of software, which would allow them to put in all of their numbers and, and start performing rapid instantaneous analysis, but then also let them start doing projection. And that was a really important transformation in financial markets in the 1980s. The ability for individuals to do rapid financial speculation on their own is is it's what builds a, a you know um, a junk bond market right it's what allows for things like leverage takeovers um, I think spreadsheet software is really a part of why the 80s were kind of known as the deal decade where you see um, this greater interest in how do I take financial assets and turn them into to more profitable assets rather than just trying to like manipulate um, a business right. Like the manipulation happened at the level of the numbers rather than kind of on the factory floor, so to speak. The the medium through which the data is flowing changes the data. Yes. Like irrevocably. Yes, absolutely. That's that that would be the essential argument, right? That it it's a it's an engine, not a camera. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh yeah, this I never I had never thought about how important spreadsheet software was until I read this chapter. It was really stunning. Uh, cause I, you know, we've been, I've been living in this world for so long. We don't even think about it. We don't even think about how much digitization has changed the world. Right. Yeah. Yeah, um, it, it, absolutely. Right. It, it, it was a transformative application in, in terms of the ra and one of the early, probably the earliest best primary rationale for why someone should own a computer. Uh, but of course people also love computers for gaming. Um, and your your gaming chapter is not Oregon Trail. It is not, no. Which, which hurt me, but I know that there's been 10,000 words spilled across the world about Oregon Trail. We all know Oregon Trail back to front. Uh, instead, it was actually a computer game I had not heard of before. Really? Yeah, I hadn't heard of this. Kind of fast, like, uh, fascinatingly, Mystery House. What is Mystery House and why was it important to the development of the personal computer? Uh, sure. Yeah. So so my interest and attention to Mystery House comes out of the fact that I've done a ton of work on a, a, the computer game co company Sierra Online. And so Mystery House was the first product of the company originally known as Online Systems. It would later change its name to Sierra Online, better known as the makers of, you know, King's Quest, Space Quest, Leisure Suit Larry, stuff like that. But part of the reason for choosing Mystery House, one, was that I, I wanted the software I was talking about to kind of move in a chronology, and the games chapter is very early. So Mystery House comes out in 1980, and it's important because it's the first graphical adventure game. And I thought that kind of the, the, the story that you get from how it's produced show, really gave us a chance to understand, yeah, the images are just like um, not great. If it's, neither, it's, not, uh, like most Sierra products, neither is the story, but the <laughs> the novelty was, oh my God, images on a screen, right? Pictures, drawings, and Ken Williams, uh, so he, so his wife, Roberta Williams, designed this game. He was the one who figured out how to program it, and he put, you know, 50, 60 some images onto a single floppy disk because he figured out how to plot them as vector coordinates rather than like a kind of bitmap uh, pixel image. And I thought that it expressed well a, a way I think about games is that games are the only kind of software that really exists to show off what a computer can do, right? There's something about games that even today, they, they love to try and exploit the limits of their hardware. 
And so games are for showboating. Games are where uh, computers seem the most magical, right? Where they seem to do things that should be impossible. And part of the, I think, electric charm and real fascination that people have around computer gaming uh, kind of comes from that quality that this is where software and hardware fight it out. It reminds me of, I'm watching the long video, that's a video essay about Myst. Yeah. Uh, and it reminds me of the, one of the great innovations of Myst was them figuring out that they could render these objects in a different program, I can't remember what it was called, and then drop them into this space and not necessarily have to have the computer render them and kind yes. of fake the idea that you're in this 3D space. And this is kind of like an earlier version of that, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, Myst, if you look at it today, it's you're like, oh, this is just a series of PowerPoint slides. Right. Like, that's, <laughs> that's what Myst is, right? Um, but it, they were able to put them together in the way that felt like it built a world. And so that I think is the, the kind of special quality that games as a type of software offer to people's rationales for why they would be interested in computers. And I, I also thought that the Sierra Online Company in particular helped give us a really good portrait of like how chaotic it was to be a company making games software for microcomputers in the early 1980s. Uh, it was a really crowded market. There was a very intense bubble that happened. Uh, there was all sorts of wild competition, you know, both from like, uh, game console companies and from arcades and from you know big mainstream publishers that wanted to come in and eat your lunch. Uh, it was a it was a really it was where the software market or industry was most like hectic and overproduced. And so it gave me a way to kind of reflect on uh, that sense of kind of just like industry chaos. It was just really a big a big part of it. And speaking of industry chaos and video games, there's so many video games out there. I don't want to pay for all of them. Right? Surely there's got to be a way I can use this new fancy Apple II machine I have and perhaps a cheaper piece of software uh, to, to grab some of these games that may have uh, digital rights management of a kind from <laughs> on them. Uh, and I believe you're writing something about, you're going to put something out about early software piracy on Motherboard in the next couple of days, right? Yeah, I'm 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 working with uh, some of the editors to about a cut from the book that'll be from a chapter on locksmith, and so this is one of the moments in the book where I get into a piece of software that, let's say, isn't beloved and well remembered by by many people. I would be interested to know in the chat who here had ever like heard of it or even used it. Um, and so Locksmith is part of this story about computing utilities. Basically, the book is organized around different software genres, basically, to try and understand the different rationales people had for why they, what, what kind of software they wanted to use and why they would buy computers. And, you know, the Locksmith is a really compelling story because it was a, it was a bit copier software, basically. It allowed you to basically thwart copy protection on your floppy disks by allowing you to make what were unauthorized duplications, right? And so this really becomes a cultural story about the threat of software piracy on the one hand, which I think is a story a lot of people have talked about with regards to early computing, but also it's a story about like how people use their computers, which is kind of was my favorite part about it. You know, why did anyone even need software like this yeah, you could pirate stuff with it. That wasn't its only rationale for owning it. It was actually the case that floppy disks are really fragile in a lot of ways. They're they're easily busted, bent, broken. They can spin out. The you know the magnetic kind of field that's holding all that data in place can can get disrupted very easily. And so you know you wanted to have backups of your disk so that in case your disk fried or you know, otherwise stop working, you wouldn't be locked out of the software that you had purchased. And you know, publishers were so worried about people stealing their software uh, that they put these draconian uh, you know, copyright protection mechanisms on them. And so Locksmith was this funny way for, uh, you know, it was, it, was a, it was a piece of software kind of intended to help people get around that kind of obstruction. Um, and 
when you go into the actual kind of archive or, or read computer enthusiast magazines, you realize that all, all sorts of funky things happen to people's floppy disks. It was probably one of my favorite part was like cataloging all these stories that people had of like, oh, I spilled suntan lotion on mine or, oh, my dog chewed up my floppy disk, uh, you know, the, the day that I bought it and, uh, you know, or it got lost in a moving truck or I put it in a in a drawer in my kitchen during a party and someone spilled ice cream on it. Like, like the, the, the kind of human stupidity level of all of this is, was really fascinating. And I, so I think that while we think of copy protection and copy breaking as a piracy story, there's also a, a story there just about like how incredibly hard it was to use these machines and to make them reliable on every single use case. Right. And how, it makes me think about how much of the stuff has survived from that era, just physically. Yeah, yeah. You know? it's, yeah, I mean, and a lot of, you know, those discs break down, you know, there's a limit on how many times, you know, basically how many clock hours a disc can can run in a floppy drive. Um, so this was my, I, I would say this is my chapter I'm proudest of in terms of technical chops, because I had to teach myself how... Uh, copy protection actually worked. We talk a lot about copy breaking. I had was never able to find something online explaining really like how copy protection worked. And so I had to really get into the, you know, get into the weeds of, uh, you know, floppy disks and floppy disk drives and kind of boot disk stuff. And yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's really, it's, it's really kind of an incredible amount of programmatic ingenuity went into creating copy protection mechanisms that, um, you know, is kind of underappreciated and lost to time at this point. Uh, somebody in chat mentioned this, and I remember this too. Uh, a lot of early games, their copyright protection was you had to look up a page in the manual and see. Yeah. Uh, I remember being befuddled by that, and now it's a, a lovely nostalgic memory for me. <laughs> Having to look up uh, like page 50 of the, the submarine game that I was playing and find like the third word, the third paragraph. Yeah, I think that those techniques tended to come out more mid late eighties, yes. early nineties. Yeah, um, definitely. You know, and and definitely the kinds of software that folks were worried about people copy breaking was stuff like VisiCalc, stuff that yep. had high price points, right? Um, I mean, certainly it, it it was it was of concern for games as well, but. Um, yeah, but the games, yeah. like you said, the games market was a little more a little more wild, a little bit more freeware. Yes. Visic, things like VisiCalc, <laughs> yeah. there was going to be a lot more, it was worth, there was a lot more money on the table. Yes, yes, absolutely. And there was a stronger, I think, uh, you know, games had this kind of inherent pull for hackers, hobbyists, young kids, folks who just, you know, the, the implications of what they were doing were maybe not totally legally coherent, you know, or maybe just people, folks didn't care, you know. Well, and there was like a... I mean, maybe this ethos wasn't developing quite yet, but there was like this this ethos in the hobbyist space that was kind of rising up at that time. Uh, maybe not in the '70s, more like the the '80s and then into the '90s of like information needs to be free; it wants to be free. That's its default state. All this just like we've we've created these tools, this digitization that allows things to be copied easily over and over again. So it should be right. Yeah, I mean, I you can certainly find traces of that ethos actually going back to the 1960s um, is kind of where it finds its origins. I think Stephen Levy does a pretty good job in his book, Hackers, kind of tracing this genesis of, because remember, the first places that had access to computers, aside from government research centers and military bases, were universities. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a tremendous acceptance of the idea that you share software freely between intellectual equals, right? And so when software starts getting commercialized, there's definitely this uh, kind of riled up uh, response that some members of the computing community have to this idea that suddenly now commercial interests are going to come in and, and kind of take away this kind of information freedom that we've been we've been so accustomed to. All right, we're hitting three o'clock now. Do I need oh, to man. do I need to let you go? Because I've got more no, questions. No, I'm, okay. I'm good. All right, well, then I'm, I'm good too, Chad, if you all want to stick around. We're going to keep going because I have to ask about, because uh, I have to I have to get to the things that we talked about off the air, uh, one of them being print shop, uh, which I had not thought of in so long. And then I was reading this book and I was like, oh, is it Broader, Broaderbund? 
I think I Broderbund. never knew how to what Broderbund. is it? Broderbund. I never knew how to say that when I was a kid. Um, but print shop hugely important and not really reported on a lot of places. Uh, why was print shop such a big deal? Why was this such an important piece of software? I mean, print shop was really the first piece of software that it had so many interesting qualities, but it allowed people to make their own kind of physical creations on the computer, right? So, so print shop, uh, you know, had this very kind of rigid framework for allowing you to produce uh, kind of objects that were intended to be printed. So the classic examples are the greeting card, which was this piece of paper you would fold up twice and to turn into a little greeting card. The banner, which I, I bet many people um, in in the in the chat probably remember the phenomena of like you know happy birthday banners at, at parties and schools. Yeah, um, on these dot matrix printers and you know there had really been no way for everyday users to make something material with the computer. I think one of the real charms of the print shop was that it allowed people to take this thing that seemed to be happening inside a box and to make it real in the world and to also personalize it to them. And the thing that was really important was, yeah, there were art making programs in the early 80s for computer users, but they were complicated. Sometimes you needed to know how to program to fully take advantage of these arts tools. And the two guys who designed Broderbund, which like I was able to track both of them down, neither of them had talked to anyone, uh, not a journalist, not, a, not an academic for like 20, 25 years. And I was able to do the first interviews with them, uh, Marty Kahn and David Balsam. And they were actually a gay couple living in San Francisco uh, in the early 1980s, um, that, you know, no longer together, but like a very, very kind of like, you know, wild to think that that this is a weirdly kind of a queer part of software history. Um, but they really designed the print shop to have this sort of rigid set of steps that a user went through. And even though it was very constrained, right? You you picked what kind of thing you wanted to make and then you picked your font and then you picked your image and then you picked your border. And even though we might think of that as being very tucked in or not allowing creativity, I think at a moment when computing was so complicated, it actually felt incredibly enlivening. People would write reviews about this software, talking about it as if it was a game. It felt fun to use in a way that computing often felt like otherwise like frustrating, annoying, <laughs> difficult. And it's it's funny looking back at it that these things that people made with this, you know, where all the kind of artistic decisions were made by someone else, still man people managed to have a great sense of personal identification with with the things that they produced in the print shop. And I, I, you know, it's kind of like a user experience design story. It's also a story about how we think about where creativity is in technology. Uh, and so I think the print shop has left behind a really like charmed memory for a lot of people because it was the first time you got to make a thing with the computer. It's also a story about fear and overcoming fear. I thought that was a really fascinating part of this chapter specifically because there was a lot of people at the time that were afraid of personal computers, right? Yeah, what? there. Yeah, to go back to the point I, I made earlier that it wasn't obvious that everyone needed to have a computer or that people knew what to do with them when they were in their home. Um, basically, if you think about it from a media history perspective, there hadn't been a new appliance in domestic space since the television, really, you know, which which comes about in the 1960s. And all of a sudden in the 1980s, there's this idea that, oh, now we're also supposed to have a computer in their home, right? Uh, you know, and so there are lots of magazines um, getting people to ask questions, everyone from like, where do you put it to how do you take care of it? There was, in fact, computer phobia was a diagnosable condition. I don't think it was DSM worthy, but it definitely came up in psychological manuals, which was just like a general fear, suspicion, anxiety, uh, you know, escalating all the way to paranoia about computing. And that could be tracked back to the 1960s. Uh, had a lot to do with the sort of opaque military origins of computing. But a lot of people want, you know, in a, in a way that I think we can very much relate to today with the concerns around artificial intelligence, people are like, we don't know the impact of this technology. What is it taking from us? 
Um, people are scared about everything from automation to kind of being, uh, you know, having kind of identity and individuality taken away. And print shop kind of gave a, I, I think it did, it kind of put a smiley face on that, a, a little digital smiley face on that whole idea. Um, it was able to seem friendly and approachable, especially to people who didn't otherwise know how to use computers. It became a great use case. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, was it the, wasn't it was... like the reason you owned a computer, but it was definitely like a fun rationale to also have. It was the reason that uh, someone else in the house got on the computer after you bought it for VisiCalc. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was popular with kind of everybody, you know, and people would try and drum up rationales to use it, right? And which really is the sign that something has gotten in your head, right? That that when you're trying to figure out, wait, what could I use ChatGPT to do or to answer or to write? That's when you have the brain worm of a new technological paradigm happening. So do you think then that... Uh, you know, not to make it about now, but then do you, are you having the brain warm about chat GPT? I mean, I, yeah, I, I definitely, uh, I guess you could say I was an early adopter. Um, and I have definitely tried to min max what I think it is good for. You know, I use it a lot as a, um, you know, I've used it as like a teaching assistant in, in various times, you know, um, I've used it to kind of source ideas about things. I've used it to kind of move information around and extract, uh, diff you know, extract different qualities from it. Um, or like a, you know, an idea generation machine when I just need a place to start. Sometimes yeah. I have it rewrite emails. Like there's a lot of, you know, if you understand its limits, I think it has surprising utility. It's not magical. It's quite stupid, in fact. Yes. But, you know, it's like having a mediocre assistant, you know. It's like having a mediocre assistant or um, like if you are a sculptor getting like half of it kind of, yeah. I don't know. It's kind of a weird, it's yeah, so strange it, to me. It gives you a bad foundation to it, start with, but yes. sometimes uh, the lift of making the foundation is such an energy suck yeah. that yeah. having someone else or something else kind of put together even a bad version gives me something to work against. It's like, uh, because we, as, as writers, you and I have both sat at that blank page screen and just uh, been stopping ourselves from opening tabs or doing all, you know, doing anything else, right? Um, and so to have a program that you can just do it for you to get started and then say, well, that's terrible. I could do better than that. And yeah, then yeah. <laughs> taking off is, is worth something. Um, yeah. I do think, you know, we're, it's not as uh, revolutionary as uh, the hype people would have you believe, but I do think that it, we're going to find some good use cases for it. So that's interesting. Yeah. I think we're going to see a lot of really terrible use cases oh, for yeah. it. If the, if the personal computer is any comparison, uh, the amount of stuff that people threw against the wall as like, maybe people want software for this. And it's like, actually, no, they don't, you know? Like, so we're going to see a lot of, uh, kind of like the early days of the iPhone store, yeah, a lot yeah. of uh, kind of iterative design disasters probably are going to come out of GPT. Um, but, you know, I think eventually kind of what it's good at will kind of surface. Yeah, we'll figure it out. It'll be fine. Uh, we'll not end the world, nor will it save it. Um, all right. I do have... We're going to skip over Stupor Troops. Sorry, which, Spinnaker fans. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. We're going to skip over Stupor Troops because I do, because we're, we're, we're coming up on an hour here. And I do want to, I have to ask you about uh, the heretical moment that ends this book uh, and the great sadness at its conclusion. Um, so can you talk about your moment of heresy for me? Um, yeah. First of all, it's so impressive that you read to the end of the book. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> So to to make this a, a a little less you know a little more clear, basically I have a I have a proper kind of academic conclusion or whatever, and then I have an epilogue at the end of the book, which is me kind of writing a short story uh, about my experience going to the oh god what was that the the retro computing fair east I believe it was called it's got some cumbersome name that I'm I'm suddenly blanking on but. It's me going to like a, a kind of retro computing festival that was happening in New Jersey in 2001. 
Uh, I was going, I was there with Jason Scott from the internet archive. He and I kind of buddied up and went together. Um, and you know, I, I, I was trying to figure out how emotionally I wanted to end this book. And I thought going to this place where everyone is kind of worshiping these, you know, old devices would be a place for me to ruminate or kind of think more about what, what, why hit, like, what is the, the hold, what is the historical compulsion we seem to have around these devices? Um, and yeah, in you know, in that it's a really interesting space of juxtaposition because on the one hand, you go to a retro computing fair and it's like you've got people who have just like souped up their machines from the early 1980s beyond all recognition, right? They're still building new software, people coming up with emulators, people doing all sorts of like weird creative hackery stuff, right? Um, and then there's this moment where I walk into the consignment floor, which is basically the kind of flea market of a retro computing festival. And what I notice is that this place is full of Apple stuff. And mm -hmm. it, it becomes a moment for me to think about, um, you know, like, where does all of this stuff ultimately go? It ultimately seems like it goes in the trash. So what is history for? Right. Or like, is it doing, do we claim, we make a lot of claims about why we want it or why we think it's important. And is that actually why we think history is important? And I, I have this moment at the end of the book where I basically say that this entire book has been a heist and that what I wanted to do was remove nostalgia from the center of identification about why we think computer history is important. You know, it's just like, all I've been here to do is rob you of your naivete that any of these things, that any of these devices exist just for the like pleasure of our memory, right? They have their own internal worlds, their own internal histories. They are so much a part of our economic and political and social structures. And we miss so much of that when all we do is like treasure them as personal objects and think of them as these like little kind of technological teddy bears, right? Uh, I think it's part of the reason that so much computer history winds up reading or sounding like a bedtime story for grown men. You know, it's like, it's like, it's it's like, is, are we just writing this shit to comfort a bunch of middle-aged guys who can't deal with their mortality? Or do we actually want to learn something? And I kind of make the argument that like learning something for real might challenge our ideas about wh why these things were important, what is valuable to know about them, uh, the kinds of people who use them, the rationales that people had for making them. And that if we want a more maybe mature idea of a computing future, we also need to have a more mature idea of our computing past. And that was really, you know, I kind of left the book with this reflection on, on, I found in the back of the consignment floor, this table that just had all these old Apple II floppy drives on it that were being sold for, I think like five or seven bucks or something, you know? Um, or no, maybe $10, I think was like written on the on painter's tape. And I was like, 40 years ago, these were the most important technical innovation in the world. And now you can't get someone to give this thing away, right? And, and so for me, I was trying to unpack that tension as a way of thinking about the importance of history more broadly. I can't think of a better ending for a cyber I think ever, uh, I can't, I, that's beautiful. And I don't want to screw it up by adding anything to it, but <laughs> if anyone wants Lane to rob them of their naivete, uh, where can we find the book? What is it called? All that Ab stuff. Absolutely. The book is called the Apple two age, how the computer became personal. It's published by the university of Chicago press. So you can find it on, uh, the UCP doc, uh, doc, I will put some links in the chat. Uh, you can find it on the University of Chicago Press website. You obviously find it on Amazon. You can request it at your local independent bookstore. Uh, it was priced to be a trade book. So it's not a kind of $50 academic text. It's definitely within, you know, intentionally because we want a wide readership for this text, uh, intentionally at a, at a kind of, you know, general consumer price point. Uh, I know at the University of Chicago Press, if you use the code UCP new, I believe it's 20% off. Uh, and I think it's still as of today flagging as like number one new release in computer industry history on Amazon, which I don't know what that means, but you know, I'll take it. <laughs>
It means As you wrote a, a damn good book. Yeah. Is what it means. <laughs> Let uh, me... Uh, and yeah. I think one of the reasons it's so good is, is exactly what you hit on at the end, because you wrote a piece of history uh, that is divorced from the nostalgia that we usually have when we are uh, talking about this subject. And I really appreciate you coming on to Cyber and answering all these questions and having this conversation with us. Uh, if you liked the show, please follow us on YouTube and Twitch where we are doing it live. Uh, there was a little conversation before the show started that you missed out on if you're listening to the podcast. But you can catch us the next time when we go live at twitch.tv forward slash motherboard TV or at youtube.com forward slash motherboard. We will, be, we will be back next week with another story about the stuff that's going on on the internet. JC will be back. And then the week after that, uh, Mr. Corey Doctorow, I think I said his name right. What a dream. Yeah, I've been, I've been dying to meet Corey Doctorow forever. <laughs> is going to come on the show. He's got a new novel. Uh, that we're going to be talking about. Now, hopefully I will be as well read on it as I was on this, <laughs> but we shall see. Um, thank you all. Thank you to the chat for showing up. Thank you, Lane, for coming on. The book is incredible. The Apple II Age, please go buy it. And I'll see everybody next week. Uh, Thursdays at 2 p.m., hard date now. That's, that's when it's happening. Bye-bye.